Hi, I'm Marky Scholes with Dragons Are Too Seldom Puppet Theater. I'm doing two videos, one on how to make a sock puppet and one on how to get that sock puppet or any other kind of puppet from being just a piece of something to being a performer in a show. So the first half that we did was how to make a sock puppet and everybody that saw that should have been able to make a sock puppet. And I'm hoping you have that sock puppet to use for this part. But if you don't, that's perfectly fine. Any puppet will do. And if you don't have a puppet, you can just put a sock on your hand and practice with that and then build a puppet later on. I have been a puppeteer for 49 years and I've traveled all over the United States, gotten to go to Europe a few times and even gotten to go to China once. I'm very, very excited about what I do. I think puppets are such a wonderful expression. Such a, You get a chance to be anything you want to be. You can be a dog, a frog, a lizard, a rat. You can be a grouch. You can be, well, you can even be a dragon if you want. That's right! I am Zed the Dragon. I am of dragons are too seldom. And I, well, I'm a star. Well, he is a star in some of the shows. I'm a star in every show. You're a star in every show you're in. You mean you do shows without me? On occasion, yes I do. Well, that's just not right. I'm gonna go sit this one out. Hmm. So, the exciting thing about puppets is that it gives you a chance to explore all kinds of parts of you that you've kind of kept under wraps up till now. So what we're going to learn to do in this video is we're going to learn how to manipulate a puppet, the things that you need to do in order to make it look alive, because you want this to be, no matter what it is, you want it to be alive. Um, and it can be anything. It can even be, I have in one of my shows, which is Quest for the Junkyard Dragon, I have a I have a helping hand that helps out the heroine a little bit. Actually, she, he doesn't at all, but this is the helping hand. And with the helping hand, I can do all kinds of motions that say that it's doing something. I can say, for instance, I can say, uh, do you do tricks? Okay, let's see you do a trick. Um, sit. Very good. How about play dead? You're a little bit of a ham, aren't you? All right, that's enough. You may go. So you have, the world is wide open to you. Everything that's on this earth, all aliens, all monsters, all fairy tales, everything is open to you. Now, this morning we made puppets. This is the one that I finished after we were done with our session. and. What I was trying to do is add some detail onto it so that it made it stand out. It made it so that my audience, which is always what you care about, it could see the various features, could see the lips. Yeah, I like my lips. And could see the nose. Uh-huh, I can breathe. <sighs> and also the eyes so that I could, I knew where to focus the eyes. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to start kind of back a little bit from where we left off last time. We're going to go through manipulating a puppet again, and we're going to do it in a little more detail. Now, the first thing that you have to know about a puppet is its anatomy, and that, mean, that means, well, it means kind of how it goes together. So that if you have a puppet, here is an illustration, and if you look in the, in the uh, down below, you will see that you, could, you have access to how to write a script, how to manipulate a puppet, how to make a, a, a finger or a, a, a sock puppet. But the anatomy of it is, is that this is the face, your fingers are the face, your head is connected to the wrist, the body is connected to the leg, you only have one leg, and that leg is your foundation. So that if you decide that you're going to talk and all of a sudden you're like this, unless you're a dog and you're lying down, this is not a good position. You want to be up and alert all the time, okay? Now, the various moving parts that you have, your wrist gives you all kinds of motion to do a million different things. You can go side to side, you can go up and down, you can go around in circles. One way is always easier than the other, but both ways are possible. And you have to remember to keep that foot so that it is so that you aren't leaning one way or the other, unless that's something you need to be able to do for your script. And your 
need to be able to do things like walk, which we'll get into a little bit more later on, but without your puppet falling flat on its face, okay? Now they can fly, but they have to take off and fly and come back around and do things like flying things do so that you have the ability to do almost everything, but it has to be contained within this puppet, okay? Now, as we were talking about on the last video, the first thing that you need to do as far as getting their four things, and the first one is focus. And focus is the eyes and making them move and see things. Most eyes on puppets are stable. They can't move around. There are some exceptions, and especially for show puppets that are really fancy ones, their eyes move back and forth and up and down and everything like that. But for the ones that we made, for the most part, they don't move. Now, maybe if you put jiggly eyes on it, it moves some. But if it does move, it doesn't move any way you can control it. So your job is to control the eyes by the motion. Now, the first thing I want you to do is I want you to have your puppet look at you. Now, the reason you're looking at each other is so that you can see where the puppet's eyes are, so that when you turn it back around, you know where the puppet's eyes are in order for it to be looking at things. If you have it so it's just straight, very often it's looking up at the ceiling. And you'll notice once in a while, your audience, when you're talking like this and looking up like that, every once in a while, your audience will go, I wonder what's up on the ceiling. You need to get the eyes down so the eyes can make contact with your audience. Okay? Now, again, we need to practice this a little bit. First of all, you need little motions that say, I am looking, I'm looking around. But if you want to look over here, then you've got to make a sudden motion so that you're over looking over there. If you want to look the other way, then you have to make it look the other way. Now you'll notice that my arm has gone wonk, wonky, but the body is still straight up and down if, if there were a stage. Okay? And you can go, you can look up, you can look down. So what the key is, is to make your wrist do the motions that we need to make those eyes focus on things. And another thing that happens when you're, when you're first starting to do a puppet show is that you do your speech and then you think, phew, I get a break. And so your puppet just kind of dies on stage. You need to be very careful that it stays alert and alive and those eyes are looking at things. Not suddenly, not, not like that, because that's upstaging and that's kind of rude. So I'm not upstaging, I'm just looking around. Okay, so if that's very important. That's number one. Number two is lip sync. And lip sync means that my lips do the same thing as my puppet's lips do. Every time I say something, my puppet says it too. It's very important that you go all the way through the alphabet so that you know the various ways your mouth will move. Like for instance, if you say P, 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 you're going to, it's an, it's an, a, it will, open and close your mouth. But if you say, mm-hmm, it's just gonna be a tiny little motion. Okay, so let's just do the alphabet. Put your finger over your lips, and if you have a mirror, this is wonderful, because you can sit and look at a mirror, and don't watch you, watch your puppet, and see if your puppet is being convincing in the way that they're moving their lips. Okay, so let's do this together. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L M N O P Q R S T U Z B D W X Y N Z. Now I know my ABCs. Tell me what you think of me. I did pretty good on that. But what it gives you an idea, especially if you're watching a mirror, or right now I'm watching the camera, so I'm seeing what my puppet is doing on the camera. But it gives you an idea of, of how interesting it is to watch your puppet as well. And so that is really, really important as we go along. Now, you have your voice, or you have your lip sync, and you have your focus. Next thing is the voice. Um, if you look at your puppet, and I don't care what puppet it is, unless you've made a caricature of yourself, it doesn't look like you. And if it doesn't look like you, there's no way it should sound like you. You can make your voice go high, you can make your voice go low. You can give yourself an accent if you want. You can make your voice very gruff. But if you do that, make sure it doesn't hurt your throat. If it hurts your throat, don't do it because you won't be able to sustain it for very long. Okay, so what you're going to do and what's going to determine what kind of a voice your puppet has is the puppet. 
So again, look at your puppet. I suspect this is a female. I am a female, thank you very much. So probably there's, it's going to have a high voice. And maybe since it's an alien, I am an alien! I could make up an accent if I wanted to. I don't know. Maybe. Well, it's just that I could talk like that if I wanted to. I don't, <laughs> but that would be that would be a possibility. What? But what is going to determine that is the character, and determining the character is going to. I'm going to have to know how old the puppet is, how young the puppet is. Um, does it like opera, or would it rather go swimming? Is it? Does it have brothers and sisters? Is it the same age you are? Is it the same age that um, your grandfather is? If it's an older puppet, I could be old if I wanted. But there's going to be a slower voice, probably, and there's going to be some deliberation. The best way to figure out voices is to listen to voices of cartoons and um, um, those kinds of things. Not, re not realism, but, but the cartoon type of voices. And then imitate a few of them and see which one you like. And then do something to tag the voice so that when you put the puppet on, you know that's the voice that puppet has. Because you could have another puppet or several puppets. My, most of my shows have between uh, 13 and 20 puppets in the show. Only two at a time, of course. That's not always true, though. There are times when I do have three at a time on one hand, like, for instance, the Niggle Nangles. This is a, this is a clothespin puppet, and the way that you do that, and this is voicing again, is, we're the Niggle Nangles, like you play. Make you feel bad. That's our way. We'll bop you, sock you, knock you in the head. Make you feel you play. And by doing my voice fast and changing it up and down, then it kind of seems like all three of them are talking, which is kind of fun. I enjoy, I enjoy doing the threes. I've got several threes. I have aliens and I have these guys. I have ducks because I think it's funny. So anyhow, uh, so let's see, where were we? We were talking about how important it is to have a voice or several voices. So now we've talked about focus. We've talked about lip sync. Lip sync. And we've talked about... Character. Yeah, that's where my voice is going to come from, and that's everything there is to be. Well, not quite. What else is there? That's what else there is. You have to be excited and enthusiastic about what you're doing. But what if I'm tired? Doesn't make any difference whether you're tired or anything else. When you're on stage, when you're performing for an audience, the audience is coming to see your energy, your excitement, your wonder. And so you have to have it. Okay, but what if I'm tired? then you better be tired with a lot of enthusiasm. Excuse me? Well, you can be tired like that, or you can be tired going, I'm so tired. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm exhausted. So, what you do, those are the four steps then. Focus, lip sync, voice and character, and enthusiasm and enthusiasm and probably of the four the enthusiasm is the most exciting you can miss the voice so you can you can go to one voice to another all those things but what you always have to be is excited about what you're doing and then your audience will be excited about it as well yep that's true so let's do jack and jill went up the hill one more time and what i'd like you to do is i would like you to We'll do this once, and then I'd like you to stop the video and practice it a couple of times, and then we'll do it again. And then I'll have a couple of my other puppets do it for you. That sounds like some kind of fun. Ha! Huh. All righty then. Here we go. Is everybody ready? Is your puppet standing up straight? Every puppet, take a deep breath. <sighs> I'm ready. I hope you're ready too. Here we go. Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. Can I hear you? I better be able to hear you. Jack fell down and broke his crown. And Jill, well, she came tumbling after. So you can put all of your energy and excitement and some kind of motions into it to make it so that you, so that people want to watch it. No matter what it is. I mean, everybody knows Jack and Jill, but you have to make it so exciting and so interesting that anybody would want to watch it. So stop the video, try it a couple of times in front of the mirror, and then come back. And we'll do it one more time, and then we'll see whether or not we can get a couple of the other puppets to do it too. All right. All right, all right. 
Let's do Jack and Jill. Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. Jack fell down and broke his crown. And Jill, well, she came tumbling after. That was fun. It was. And at the end, of course, all puppets always take a bow. And puppeteers take a bow. All right. So let's try. How about Growl? He sits up here doing not very much. So let's just see how he would do Jack and Jill went up the hill. This is Growl the Troll. That's right. I a troll. Can you do Jack and Jill? I don't think I know it. Could you try? I could try, but I don't think I know it. All right, I tried. <clears throat> Jack and Jill, they went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. Jack, well, he fell down. We don't know why he just fell down. It was kind of sad. And broke his crown, which I think is his head. I don't think he had a real crown. And Jill, well, she came tumbling after. <clears throat> so that's the Rawls version of it. All right. So, this is characterization. This is getting so that you know your puppet well and so that you can get him to uh, act and do all the things that he's supposed to be, he or she is supposed to be able to do. Now, suppose that you want your puppet to start over on one side of the stage and to walk towards the other side. So, you, the thing about your audience is always in front of you. So you don't want to keep your puppet to the side all the time because there's not much interesting there where there's a lot interesting in front of you. So if you're going to have your puppet walk, you probably want them to look forward. And then by swinging your wrist back and forth just a little bit, it looks like they walk and kind of bouncing up and down. Now you get back over here and you certainly do not want them to zing back like a typewriter. Instead, when they get over here, they're going to have to turn around, and it's not easy, and walk back the other way. And check around, and always keep cheating to the audience. It's called cheating to the audience because you keep looking at the audience because you want them to be included in your action. So it's really important when you are making motions that you always check on your audience to make sure everybody's doing okay. You'll notice this is a different puppet. It's a dip I use the same supplies to make this one, but it's got... A mouth that's full of buttons and so he clanks when he talks which I'm not sure I'm very fond of <laughs> anyhow so that's the first part then that this is the manipulation and you can practice this for hours and hours and hours or in my case I've been practicing for 49 years you get so you can do more and more subtle things the first time I got a puppet to swallow I was in seventh heaven because it was something that I hadn't thought that a puppet could do as soon as I figured it out, I went, yes, all right. And my puppets swallow a lot now. And so that every motion that you do, there's always more that you can do with it. That exaggeration is so important. So that if you were going to have a puppet that was going to sneeze, where's my puppet, okay. If you're going to have a puppet that was going to sneeze, you could have it be very quiet. Or you could have it really, really sneeze. <gasps> Excuse me. So the quiet sneeze was okay as long as you gave it a lot of energy. Achoo! That's a whole different thing than your exaggerated sneeze. But whatever you do, you need to see, you need to think about how you can do it bigger and bolder. And after you've gotten it so you think it's as big and bold as it possibly can be, you probably can increase it 10 more times. Because the more you do that, the more fun it is. So, it's very important that you keep practicing on it and seeing if there's something you can do that makes it better. Now, once you have that emotion down and you can do all of that, then it's time to maybe work on a script. Now, there are millions of ways of working on script. You can do, actually, the whole thing can be you and the human talking back and forth. Again, let me see. I've got Estelle. And Estelle is a mouse. I didn't see that. Show me again. Show me again. All right. Now then, I am a mouse. We know that. You look like a mouse. I know I do. I look exactly like a mouse because I am a mouse. Now, I am doing part of the dialogue. The mouse is doing part of the dialogue. And 
her lips are moving. This is true. I'm a puppeteer. I am not a ventriloquist. So my lips do move. But I have discovered a trick. When I have puppets and I want them to be watching the puppets and not watching me, what I do is I watch the puppet. Then the audience looks at me to see what I'm doing, and then I'm looking at the puppets, so they look over here. And then I get to do what I want to do over here, and I can do anything! And they don't even see her very much. So that's important that you can do it so that you have yourself and your puppet, or two puppets. The thing you have to do is remember which one is which and what their voices are, and you have to remember what your part in the whole play is, too. And whatever, I really think it's important that you watch whatever puppet is talking, and it makes a big difference. People don't even realize that I'm back there, so it's kind of interesting. All right, so that's a way to do a puppet show. Another way is to uh, think of stories that you know. They want it to be simple, and for the first few times, you want your story to be very, very short, not more than five minutes preferably two. And the reason for that is because it makes you condense everything down so that it's all action-packed and exciting. If you get carried away and all of a sudden your show is 45 minutes long, for one thing, your arm is going to get exhausted and your puppet's going to be down like this and the energy, it's hard to keep energy up that long. So you can use a fairy tale, uh, Three Little Pigs. You can use um, a story that you make up, but it's got to be very, very simple. You've got to, uh, you can use... Um, a show you saw, and but you got to condense it down until it's little. You can use par parables. You can use um, nursery rhymes. You can well, that's what we did, Jack and Jill. That is a nursery rhyme, but all of them, you just keep them simple and short and over the top excited, and then you have you win doing it. Now the the t talking about doing an actual script, what you have to do is several different steps to begin with. I think. The way that I do it is that, first of all, I start with an idea. I have to figure out what it is that I want my show to be about. Um, I do summer reading programs quite often, and they have a summer reading theme. And so very often I take the summer reading theme, and I have that be my basis. So one year it was Read the Seven Seas, and I thought that was an interesting theme. They wanted it, it was for, I was doing it in New Mexico, so they wanted their the library's rabbit and uh, bobcat to be the, the heroes, which of course is a problem because you don't think of rabbits and bobcats on the oceans very often. So I made up a show that was, that was the, the, uh, the Great Water Crystal, and it was about the valley at the beginning of time before there were humans that had, um, that, that was perfect for animal, animals to live in. And then Pirate Pee Wee Fox, and his terrible assistant, Flynn the Fast-Footed Ferret, who are both pirates, come and steal the water crystal and take it to the Seven Seas. So then Millie Rabbit and Bob Bobcat have to go after them. So that gave me all kinds of opportunities to figure out all kinds of strange situations for them to be in, including they, ended up, they end up um, finding a dragon that helps them along the way, and they end up finding... There's all kinds of ex adventures they have. There's a crab that is kind of helpful, and there is a... Uh, Maureen, the sea gnome, who would rather not help them. But anyhow, it gives, you, it gives you springboards to start with. So then I have the beginning of my show. And then I go with a formula that is so very simple. And this, again, down below, there'll be a, there'll be a link to my site. And these, uh, how to write a script, how to do these things, will be there. So you can, you can re go back and refer to them. But when you're writing a script, it a, always has a beginning, a middle, and an end. All right. In the beginning, there is a who, what, when, where, why. So what you're doing is you're building your world so that everybody knows is on the same page. You don't necessarily even need real names, but you've got to have some kind of recogniz recognizable things in it so that people feel comfortable coming into your world for your story. So like the who is who's in here. So in, the, in my story, it was it was Bob, Bobcat and Millie Rabbit. And um, where it was in this huge valley that was the rain came from a water crystal. Uh, who, what, when? It was long, long, long before humans were on the earth. Uh, where in this valley, in this great big valley. So I've got all of these things established and all the rules because the most important thing when you are making a script, and this is true if you are writing, if you are Shakespeare or if you are 
making cartoons or whatever you're doing. The most important thing is whatever rules you establish for your play, your characters cannot break those rules. So for instance, if my rule is that my puppets can talk, they can, and that's fine. But if all of a sudden, in halfway through the show, the bobcat stops being able to talk, stops being able to communicate, I've broken my own rules. And if I do that, then it's going to be confusing for the audience. So this is a story, and it's a story that you want every part of it to go together and to fit in. So in the beginning, we have the the who, what, when, where, why, and the why, of course, is that they have to get uh, is that that something is going to go wrong, and the, that is the middle. Something has to go wrong, and in this particular instance, what goes wrong is that pirate Pee Wee Fox and his terrible assistant Flynn the Fast Footed Ferret steal the water crystal, so it cannot rain in the valley, and there can't be any plants growing, and no food for the animals. So. They have to figure out a solution for the wrong, which is to send Bob Bobcat and Millie Rabbit, who don't really want to go after uh, after Pee Wee and Flynn, in order to get to the seven get the seven seas, get the water crystal back, and get rain to come again. Okay, that's the wrong. In the middle, that's what, the beginning of that. But towards the end of the middle, you want the wrong to be solved. Start being solved. We know how this is all going to turn out. This is going to be okay. We're going to figure it out and. That's what happens is that, that Bob, Bobcat, and Millie uh, Rabbit figure out a way to steal the water crystal back from Pee Wee and Flynn and bring it back to the Seven Seas, which of course, uh, back to their valley, which of course they can't because they've come a long, 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 long ways. But they have a dragon who can fly. And so the dragon flies them back to the valley, solving all the situation. And that is, that is the, um, um, the end. So you have the beginning, the middle, and the end. Now, in the end, the end is the solving of the problem, but it's one more thing. It's the kicker. And the kicker is that we get back on land, we got the crystal back where it belongs, everything is going to be fine, and so the main characters say something that makes you think that they're going to be all right. This is fine. This is wonderful. I'm so glad to be home. I'm going to go home and make a carrot cake. Boom. It finishes. In other words, you can't say, okay, this is the end. You've got to finish it. And then you have your show. You have your beginning, you have your middle, and you have your end. This is just, and the thing about shows with puppets is there's a tendency to want to have me be the narrator. I'll tell most of the story. Puppet will come up and do one line and go back down again because you're not used to working with puppets. So, for the first few shows you do, I suggest if you have a narrator, they can't have more than one line. So they can introduce, but this if this puppet is in the laundromat for the very first scene, then you want the puppet to say something like, I hate to come to the laundromat. It's not so clean, you know. And I always lose two quarters. I don't know why I always lose two quarters. So what you've done is you've established what kind of character this is. You've established that you're in a laundromat. You've established all of those kinds of things. Now, this is just a beginning on how to do all of these pieces and parts. I would love to have you write questions. Anything that you want to know more about this, if you would like, I would love to have you send me shows that you've done. I'd love to watch them. But I've really, really enjoyed talking to you about this, and I hope that you do magnificent puppet shows. Thank you very, very much.